Hey guys, welcome back to Chess24. This is Jan Gustafsson and this is a video about the game of the day in the Qatar Masters. Shak Yarov with the white pieces against Anish Giri with the black pieces. Anish Giri, the number one seed, is sitting pretty on four out of four before this game. Shak Yarov is behind, he's the number two seed and he will use the white pieces try to ca trying to catch up with Anish. Without further ado, let's get straight into the game. Here we get the board and we see Mamed Yarov opened 1c4 with white. Giri played knight f6. Should move, make the moves actually. Knight f6 and after knight c3 he went e5. Now this brings us to the first interesting moment, at least in my mind. Why didn't he go 1e5 immediately? 1c4 is an excellent move and the reason we don't see it even more often on top level is that it gives black the option of going e5. Still, what Anish does here is a very interesting subtlety to start with knight f6 and to only play e5 after knight c3. The reason is that if you start with e5, very often white will go g3 here in this position. And if you were to go knight f6 now, they would go bishop g2. There's no knight committed to c3 yet, which means, for example, that black does not have the option of going bishop b4, trying to exchange that knight. So that's an advantage for white, because it gives him some flexibility and some more options, avoiding some black lines. Now, of course, you could and should ask yourself, why after c4 knight f6, if white wants that, doesn't he go g3 himself? And very often they do. In fact, I believe this is the move which was recommended by Marine in his books on the English opening. However, now black can choose not to go e5 and has some promising options that would not be so good in other lines, namely c6. This is a pretty effective recipe against the setup with g3 and is an option white players normally do want to avoid. Therefore, they go c4, knight f6, Knight c3 first, when c6 wouldn't make a lot of sense, white could just play e4. So this is a very interesting subtlety, and if your opponent is a pure English player, who is very unlikely to go d4 here or knight f3, or if you want him to go d4 or knight f3, it often pays to start with knight f6, wait for a move until white went knight c3, and then play e5, as seen in this game by Anish Giri. And here, Mamed Yarov interestingly chose the move g3 now, which, as I just mentioned, is a totally normal setup. But once again, this is about small subtleties. And in this position, normally white, if he wants to go g3, he starts with knight f3, more or less forcing knight to c6, and now plays g3. The reason for this is that here, having included knight f3 and knight c6, could be a little bit in white's favor, because black no longer has the chance of playing pawn to c6 and a later d5, which we will see in the game, while white really doesn't lose much by putting his knight to f3. So by no means a mistake, but an interesting move order here by both sides, and Anish makes use of the extra option playing bishop b4, leading to some kind of bishop b5 Sicilian with colors reversed and of course a tempo less, but a pretty good choice if you want to equalize with the black pieces and stumble upon this position. Bishop b4, bishop g2, castles. Mamed Yarov chose the move e4, which to a less experienced player might just look like a mistake. He's blocking his own bishop, he's weakening the d4 square. But it's actually one of the most ambitious and principled setups here, I believe championed by Botvinnik, trying to clear this e2 square for the knight getting a grip on the d5 square and then slowly building, winning more space with either f4 or d4 later. So e4 is a very principled move and I believe the main line here, or arguably the main line, knight f3 has also been seen quite a bit. And it is one option that Mamed Yarov of course kept by not going knight f3 earlier as I was mentioning. However, now black makes use of the extra option he has, which is he doesn't have the knight commit to c6 yet. And he starts with bishop takes c3, which is very natural, doubling white's pawns before white gets a chance to play knight e2, sending reinforcements to the c3 square. 
B takes C3 is the critical move. D takes C might be possible, but it leads to a more static structure where black really would have very little to fear. He could just go D6 and play this position quietly. Instead, B takes C is a lot more ambitious, keeping more pawns in the center. Here, another slightly interesting point, Giri starts with rook e8. The most commonly, move, commonly seen move in this position is the move c6, intending to break in the center with d5. Which is really interesting, because it might look like white has these double pawns, and you do want to keep the center closed. White also has the two bishops. But in this position, and it goes to show why chess is so difficult, the general rules don't really help you that much and would be a strategic mistake to keep the position closed, just do nothing with d6, let's say knight e2, whatever, c5, I'm making bad moves here on purpose, castles, knight c6. White would be better because it's much easier to build up his play with d3, then he would play h3, later f4, and create counterplay or create an attack on the king side, which would be very hard to stop if he's not bothered in the center. This is something that computers even nowadays also fail to understand a little bit. But the human top players have figured out for a long time that in this position you actually do want to open the center because you want to use the slightly weakened light squares in white's camp, which could become obvious later if the center is blown open. And here it's more of a case of black getting his piece into the game and opening the position than in keeping it closed and being afraid of the two bishops. He wouldn't equalize like that. Now Gary of course knows this and the mover that he chooses, he starts with rook e8 while most players start with c6. Maybe he disliked the option bishop a3 here after c6 when the bishop occupies this diagonal. Even though here after rook e8 I'm not convinced bishop a3 helps white all that much because after bishop d6, rook e6 looks like black is doing pretty well. So Giri goes rook e8, d3, and c6. Once again, you have to open the center here, chip away at this white construction, and hope there will be weakened squares behind it. Knight to e2, d5, no surprise anymore. c takes d, c takes d, e takes d, knight takes d5. And we have an interesting situation, where white has the two bishops, which I love, as you all know, but black has very free piece play, will put his knight on c6, this bishop, wherever it's most convenient, e6, f5, g4, maybe even h3 later. And he has very free piece play and a bit more space in the center, thanks to the e5 pawn. While the white pawns on d3 and c3 could potentially be a little bit weak. So, I would say the position is equal, but it might be easier to play with black actually, because his play yeah, it's just easier. Get the pieces out, while white has to be very accurate. Shaq starts with rook to b1, very logical move, occupying the half-open file, keeping an eye on b7, knight c6, castles, and Giri starts showing why his position is easier to play with a very strong move, bishop to g4. It's a very annoying move to face. It's threatening knight takes c3, and it's also threatening bishop takes e2, followed by knight takes c3. It's not so easy to parry. If white just played bishop to d2, black would go queen d7, planning to play bishop h3, h3, eliminating this very strong bishop and maintaining the initiative. So it's not a nice move to face. And Mamed Yarov found nothing better and believe there is nothing better than playing f3, parrying the threats, but of course severely restricting his pride and joy on g2. And after f3, Giri took an inter <laughs> I can't speak. interesting decision by going bishop to f5. Pretty much every other square you could make a case for as well. Bishop e6 has its pluses. Even bishop c8 you could argue for defending this, this pawn. Now Giri went bishop f5, which is the most aggressive move. Offering this pawn and saying, Go ahead, I dare you to take it. Mami Dyarov does take it, and he kind of has to as well. If he were to wait for a move, knight b6 is a threat, black would just be better. So you gotta take this off. 
And the black idea was to go knight b6 here. Kind of trapping the rook in his own camp and also threatening bishop takes d3. White only has one good move. He's got to send some reinforcements towards the rook. And the only correct move here, which is played by Mamed Yarov, is the move f4, opening his bishop's diagonal and planning to put pressure on c6 so this rook can't be picked up by something like bishop c8, queen c8, you name it. If black were to play queen c8 here, might look tempting because the rook actually does not have an escape square, but white would have the very promising exchange sacrifice. f takes e5, queen takes b7, rook takes f5. And this position is good for white. He has two pawns for the exchange and his mighty bishop now reigns free on this diagonal. So nothing black wants. Of course, Geary had anticipated this sequence and he was pinning his hopes on the move e4 when play becomes really sharp. And this is the position where I believe Mamed Yarov went wrong. He played the move queen to b3. And it's, it's not really my belief that he went wrong. That's the beauty of modern chess or the curse of modern chess, depending how you want to see it. An engine will tell you instantly where these very, very strong players make mistakes. So we can all be smart in real time and yell, wow, Mamed Yarov just blundered by queen b3, which is true, but it does sometimes make us lose respect for how strong these players are. They say he should have played d takes e4 when it looks like white barely manages to equalize the game. It still doesn't look that pleasant, but at the moment he is a pawn up, which is useful for defense since he can return one if he needs to. And now he should have gone queen to b3. Threatening queen takes f7. Black needs to spend a move on something like queen to f6. White can go knight d4, solving the problem of moving this knight out of the e-file. Barely maintaining the... Oh no, I'm sorry, I just blundered. This does not work because here black wins after takes, takes, takes. And rook to e2. With queen c6 in the air. What I meant to say is after queen to f6, white has to take on e4 first. This is the difference. And now after rook takes e4, now play knight to d4, not knight d4 immediately. And this does barely maintain the balance. Still looks more pleasant for black, but after knight takes d4, c takes d, queen takes d4, king h1, it looks like there is nothing concrete black can do and white should survive. So, not the most pleasant scenario for Shaq Mehmed Yarov, but he should have calculated this and pinned his hopes here. Because after queen b3, it turns out he's already in real big trouble. Black played bishop to e6, attacking the queen and defending f7. And of course, there's still the option of e takes d3 in the air. Now, Yarov clearly had planned the move queen b5. All other moves are bad as well. This was his idea, so he went with it. And Giri took on d3. And I believe this is the position where Mamed Yarov miscalculated from far away. I'm sure he was intending to play bishop takes c6, which would be fine if black had to take on e2, d takes e, queen takes e2, and white is fine. But the move I think he missed is the bone crusher bishop to c4 intermediate move interrupting the white's connection, the white's queen's, con white's queen's connection to the knight on e2. And black is winning. Let's say queen c5, d takes e2, rook e1, rook to c8, pinning this bishop. It's just game over. Queen d1 is looming, rook e6 is looming, picking up the bishop. It's just nothing white can do. So after e takes d3, I'm sure Mount Yarov spotted here what he had done. The bishop takes c6 doesn't work. He tried the slightly desperate rook takes b6 to take the bishop c4 option out of the position, but it's not good enough to save the game. Now white goes d takes e2. And of course, the big difference is that here queen takes e2. Doesn't really help because it runs into queen takes b6. Check. Black is a whole rook up. Game over. 
Instead of that d takes e2, rook e1 was tried when queen, to, queen takes b6 wouldn't be so clear yet because white takes and he wins back almost all his material by taking on c6. But instead, Giri went for the bone crusher bishop to c4 temporary peace sacrifice clarifying the situation. Actually, instead of bishop c4, there was another very pretty win, which is knight to d4, also just ending the game immediately. c takes d, queen takes d4, king h1, a takes b6. And if white tries to reclaim his material with bishop e8, there is, well, there's multiple wins, but the simplest is rook takes. And the difference here is not the material, but the strength of the pieces and especially the opposite colored bishops which is illustrated quite nicely by rook takes e2 bishop d5 check and checkmate is about to come rook g2 queen d1 so there were multiple ways to roam and the root of white's problem of, of course was missing this bishop c4 earlier even after rook e1 bishop c4 was still good enough to get the job done Bishop c4, queen takes c6, queen to d1, just power play here based on this far advanced pawn. King to f2 is forced in order to stop immediate defeat, but it didn't because black played rook a d8 and I believe this is the last move of the game already. Shaq Mehmed Yarov resigned here, which means Anish Giri not only defeats the number two seat, he's the number one seat himself, with black in 21 moves, he also keeps his perfect score. He's on 5 out of 5 now and he keeps his move average down very nicely. He won in 18 moves yesterday. I made a video about that game. He wins in 21 moves with black today. It's all very impressive stuff. Let's have one brief look why at why white had to resign. It's basically nothing he can do. Black is threatening queen takes e1 followed by rook d1 check a neutral move let's say bishop a3 this just decides the game instantly with a new queen and there is not a lot of defenses rook takes d1 just e takes d1 queen and white is a ton of material down additionally he's gonna get checkmated soon so it was by no means too early to resign after rook a d8 not a good day at the office for Shaq Mamedyarov and Anish Giri keeps cruising. Let's have a brief look at the Chess24 website. Oh no, this is not it as usual. Here it is to see the standings. I believe here we can see them. Giri on 5 out of 5. Niels Grandelius, the Swedish Grandmaster, on 4.5 out of 5. Following him, I'm guessing the two of them are gonna play tomorrow. But yeah, Anish Giri has looked pretty good so far. And if you're wondering if I'm a massive Anish Giri fanboy because I'm doing a video about him every day, simple answer is yes, I basically am. And I have proof. Here's a terrible picture of me and Anish, but it's the proudest moment of my life, basically. And I will remain a Giri stalker. In the Live ratings, our boy Giri is also doing very, very well. He's up to number seven. Vishyanand is still 10 points ahead of him, actually won a point in the match against Magnus Carlsen. Levan Aronian, number five, and then we have the 2800 club starting with Veselin Topalov. On top, of course, we have Magnus Carlsen, the new and old world champion whose birthday, I believe it is, today at the time of recording, November 30th. Happy birthday, Magnus! That's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed the game Mamed Yarov against Anish Giri. I'm pretty sure Anish Giri enjoyed it and Shak Mamed Yarov did not. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you around in the next one. Bye!